Good morning, everybody. For you at home, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 3. This morning is uh, Palm Sunday. This is going to be the first Sunday where I've not preached a Palm Sunday message. But that's okay. This is not a regular Palm Sunday. Today I want to preach about the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3.16 is quoted more than any other verse quoted in the Bible. As a matter of fact, this verse has gotten so famous that we see our footballers putting it uh, below their eyes and those little black strips and they'll write John 3.16 on their faces. You see fans in the crowds at, at sporting events with John 3.16 on, on billboards and placards. Most children who've uh, gone through any kind of Sunday school curriculum could probably quote to you John 3.16. Most of you right now listening to me, even if you don't read the Bible a lot, if you heard John 3.16, you'd know exactly what someone was talking about. You've probably heard it before. And there might be some of you that haven't. And so today, I do want to read from this passage and give some context. There's something incredible attached to this Verse. These are the words of Jesus Christ. Starting in John chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 11. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There it is. Notice in this verse the word for in verse 16. For. For God so loved the world. When you see for or you see therefore in Scripture, always go back to what was said before to get the context of what's really being said here. So let, let me read this one more time. In verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal everlasting life. This passage speaks of Moses lifting up a bronze serpent on a pole in the wilderness, and Jesus talks about the Son of Man being lifted up. And Jesus Christ is lifted up on the cross on a pole where he's tortured and he dies for the sin of the world. Jesus himself is the first one, to explain this strange event that is found in the book of Numbers. Now, let me finish this passage, and then we'll go to book, the book of Numbers. Let me read verse 17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Amen. Now turn with me to Numbers chapter 21. Let's look at this strange happening in Numbers Chapter 21, 
The children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They've had their Passover. They've passed through the Red Sea. They're traveling, and it says there in verse 4 in Numbers chapter 21, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now listen, verse 5, they're complaining to God. God has been sending them manna from heaven to feed them. They are eating miracle bread every day, and they complain and say, our soul loathes this worthless bread. These are some hard words that they speak against the Lord. In verse 6, it says, so the Lord, the Lord, remember, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now notice there in verse six, it says, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Now the scriptures describe these serpents as being fiery, but it's not speaking to their appearance as though they were set on fire, that they were these fiery serpents that had like like a fire mohawk for hair or something. What it means is, is that their bite burned like fire. They were poisonous snakes is what he means. These fiery serpents, when they bit the people, the poison burned their flesh and people died because of the poison and the venom of these serpents. Now it says there, it says there they confess, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Look there in verse eight. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now notice the specific words that God uses. He says, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. Take the thing that's causing them torment. Take the thing that I sent as a judgment against them. Take that and make an image and put it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Now, notice that in verse 9, Moses did exactly what God said and that the people did exactly what God said. Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was, if a, certain had, a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Just the ones who'd been bitten by a serpent this was not a cure-all for every other ailment. God doesn't say if someone gets some other disease, if they look at the bronze serpent, it'll heal them too. No, it's for this specific judgment. Remember back in verse 6, the Lord sent the fiery serpents. This is where many of us get it wrong. I get it wrong. That a lot of times we like to think that somehow the devil is in the business of judging God's people. The devil has no fiery serpents to send. The devil does not create diseases. The devil is not a creator. There's only one creator. Every virus, every bacteria, every living thing has been made by creator God. Now, this is a hard statement, especially, especially if you're sick. Especially if you have loved ones, God forbid, but even children who have a disease. People want to deny that God would create such a thing. In this particular instance, God 
is judging the people because of their complaints towards him. They spoke against him. And he is the one that sends judgment. The scriptures declare that we are sinners. That God himself has declared all under sin. And the punishment for sin is death. The punishment for sin is death. Do you know it is not the devil who came up with that punishment? God is the one who told Adam, in the day that you eat of this tree that I told you not to eat, you shall surely die. The judgment for sin was given by God. The judgment for sin is given by God. That all things find their origin in God, including judgment and destruction. God's a just God. The same God who sends this judgment, the same God who gives these fiery serpents as a punishment is the same God that gives the remedy because he's loving and kind. God will not leave sin unpunished, but the same God who punishes sin is the same God who will give grace to all those who will obey his word, to all those who will have faith in what he says. Did God say, God said, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who looks at it will live. All those who are bitten and looked, live. And then it says, all those who were bitten and looked at it, lived. They believed God's word. They had faith. Even in the Old Testament, we see examples of faith. Faith is not a New Testament thing. Faith is a universal thing in the church and congregation of God. Faith has been from the beginning because faith comes from God himself. These people look at this bronze serpent, and it's not because of the bronze serpent. It's because they do what God tells them to do. That's the part we need to see. Many people will take God's prescription for specific instances, and we think we have to apply it to everything. And even some of our symbols and some of our teachings and some of our doctrines end up becoming idols that we worship more than the creator who gave them to us. We need to be careful about this, church. We have to be careful about this. It happens with preachers and church buildings and gatherings. There are some people that worship their own church congregation more than they worship the God whom they're supposed to. There are some people that think, if I don't do worship the way I think I should do it, then I haven't worshiped God. Friends, that's idol worship. To to create an image that you think this is what it has to be like, and if, if it isn't this, then I'm not worshiping. God's everywhere. Listen, God is in everything. You can worship God at any time, any day of the week. There are some who have made a day their day of worship. Listen, if you want to worship on Saturday, that's fine. I have no problems with you worshiping God on Saturday because I worship God on Saturday and Friday and Thursday. Count them all up. I worship every day. So pick a day. Today, that's the day you should pick. Now, see, I'm going against my word there. Now I'm making an idol. Today, you're saying today is the only day. Well, today, the scripture said, today is the day of salvation. Today. While it is called today, amen, amen, tomorrow I ain't here yet. Let me move on. Second Kings verse, chapter 18, verse 1. I want to show you something interesting. This is the only other instance in the Old Testament where this bronze serpent is mentioned. Listen to what it says. Now, it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, and that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became King, now, 25. To some of us, some of y'all were just getting out of school around 25. Some of y'all were just finishing up schooling and starting a new career, and you were entry-level apprenticeship program, not, not leading the kingdom. You were just trying to get started in a career at 25. This man is king at 25 years old, and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. 
His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. Now listen to this, what is said about Hezekiah. It says, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. It's saying that he's a descendant of David. That's why he's the king of Judah. He's of the line and the tribe of Judah, David's tribe. That's also the line of the tribe of Jesus. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's in his family line. And so it says that according to all that his father David had done, this is how Hezekiah lived. He was a righteous king. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image. Now, this is speaking of the Asherah poles. The Hebrew word is literally Asherah. The wooden images, the Asherah poles, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Nehushtan is a Hebrew word. It literally means a brazen thing or the bronze one. The bronze serpent became an idol that was worshipped. How can I say that it was worshipped? It says that they, they burned incense to it. The burning of incense is a picture of prayer and offerings of worship to a god. So there were people in, in Israel who were worshipping this bronze idol that Moses had made. Now listen, God's the one who told him to make it. God is the one. That, well, if God told him to make it, isn't it a good thing? It has to be a good thing, right? But here's the thing. If God is the one that told Moses to make it, it should be used in the way God prescribes. God never tells them to burn incense to it. God never tells them to worship it. Now this isn't something that is just relegated to the old church or the old congregation in the wilderness or in the kingdom of Judah. This happens today where we worship things. We spend our resources and time on things that are not God. That doesn't mean all those things that you spend time and resources on are idols, but there are some things that people can't live without. You know, there are some people that worship their pillow when they get home at night. You think that's silly. There are people that get in their bed and they hug their pillow tight and they say, oh, I'm so glad to be with here with you. I have such peace when I'm with you. Oh, thank you, my pillow. You give me such comfort. God is supposed to be our peace. God's Holy Spirit is our comforter. We have to be careful of not making another brazen thing that takes the place of God. Amen? Amen. Let's look here. This is an interesting thing. I want to show you why I'm talking about this brazen serpent today. This, uh, this brazen serpent brought up a legend later on in Greek mythology. This is actually older than Greek mythology, okay? This happened in the wilderness with Moses. This is not the only mythology and legend that has a serpent on a pole, okay? There's also a Phoenician, you find in Phoenician and Sumerian, ancient Sumerian culture, they have wine goblets that have snakes wrapped around them and these different things, and there's a worship of a serpent. Now, this particular symbol, the rod of Aesculapius, uh, it's spelled a couple different ways if you want to look it up. This is a rod that, of Aesculapius, who was a Greek god in myth that uh, had to do with healing and medicine. Now, this symbol appears in modern times. I've seen this symbol so many times in the past month. That first one in the light blue on the top right is the symbol for the World Health Organization. The one on the bottom right, that is the star of life used by a lot of emergency ser uh, services. It has a serpent with a rod. This symbol throughout history has been a symbol for healing and medicine. And even today, you can look it up, there are at least 50 that I found this week, 50 different organizations, and there's probably much more than that. About 50 of them on universities, uh, uh, state government, where this symbol of a serpent wrapped around a rod is used for uh, medical clubs, used for directors of medicine, used for hospitals, uh, blue cross and blue shield. On the blue cross is a person on a blue cross, and on the shield is this symbol, the rod, with the serpent wrapped around it. 
Now, sometimes people get it confused with the caduceus. Now, this one's a little bit different. This has the twin snakes wrapped around a rod, and there are some wings added to it. Now, this is often called the staff of Hermes. It's Hermes was the herald of the gods. Now, his Roman counterpart would be Mercury, and this symbol is a symbol that's often used for two different things, logistics, logos, the word, the idea of messages being sent, but also merchandise. And I find it funny that there are some doctors that will have this symbol on their license plate, and you got to watch out for that because uh, being a symbol of merchandise, they might be charging you too much for your health services. Sorry, that's a joke. That's a bad one. But listen, it's an interesting myth. I bring this up, not that you should worship it, Not that you should look to it as some symbol of hope, but it's just interesting in the way that mankind has chosen to explain the divine. There's a connection here. There's a reason. They didn't just come up with this on a whim. Somebody saw this. Somebody thought of this. Somebody dreamt this. The interesting thing about the myth of Hermes is that he's able to move quickly and freely between the worlds of the mortal and the divine because of his winged sandals. Now, this is a myth. This is a legend. I don't believe in Hermes. I don't worship Hermes. But I find it interesting that Hermes is able to mediate between the divine world and the mortal plane. Also, according to legend and according to Homer, the great writer, in his uh, uh, hymn to Hermes, he writes that Hermes was the messenger of the gods and would guide mortals into the afterlife. Now, human heralds, human messengers, they're originally messengers that were sent by monarchs, kings, to convey messages or royal proclamations, in this sense being the predecessors of modern diplomats. Heralds, herald, you know what a herald is, what I'm, what I'm saying there, a herald is someone who comes with the proclamation of the king. And they'll say, back in the olden times, the olden times, they would say, hear ye, hear ye, by decree of her majesty the queen, Yada, 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 right? Like, they would bring a proclamation. A herald would cry out in the streets a proclamation from the king or queen telling the people what the king or the queen's words and will and decrees are. The herald brings a message, a message to the people from royalty. Now, the scriptures speak of Christians being such heralds. We're called ambassadors. We're called ambassadors in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Listen to this. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, just as a king would speak through a herald. God is speaking through the ambassadors of Christ. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'll show you the connection here in a second. Some of you already see it. First of all, an ambassador, what's an ambassador? An ambassador is an official envoy, especially a high-ranking diplomat who represents a state and is usually accredited to another sovereign state or to an international organization as the resident representative of their own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. In other words, an ambassador is a messenger sent from their own kingdom to live temporarily in a foreign land to represent the interests of the king who sent them. You are an ambassador for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You have been sent to live temporarily in this world and represent the interests and the decrees of the king, Jesus, who sent you. You're an ambassador of Christ. And he says... It's though, as though God were pleading through us. Listen, if a herald or an ambassador says, this is what the king says, he's been given a seal of approval by the king that whatever he speaks, the king will back up with his military. 
The king will back up with his own authority. This is the power of an ambassador. As though God himself were pleading through us that when you proclaim Christ to the world, God is proclaiming Christ through you. You're his ambassador. And God is the one who will back up your words. If you speak truth, If you speak truth and do it in love, God himself will give authority to the words that you speak. Be reconciled to God. That's the message. For, there's that word, for. Why? Why? He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus Christ did not know sin. But he became sin for us on the cross of Calvary. In other words, there was sin in the world, just like there were fiery serpents among the people as a judgment from God. But Jesus, Jesus became that fiery serpent. He became sin. We lifted him up on a cross and the judgment of God was poured out on Jesus Christ. And everyone who looks to him shall be healed. Everyone who looks to him shall have eternal life. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. The very thing that condemns our soul, sin, Jesus took upon himself the judgment of God for our sin. Just as that bronze serpent was used by Moses. Let's look back at our verse. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus himself compares himself to the serpent in the wilderness. He tells us ahead of time what he's going to do. Thousands of years before Christ was born, the Lord told us what he was going to do through Moses. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now listen, there are many who quote this scripture. It's quoted so often. But this this scripture is not a call to sit around and wait for eternity. You have to look at everything he said. This is a call to look around us now and share the hope and do good to others. Just as God so loved the world and sent his son, he has sent you as an ambassador, you as an ambassador, you as an ambassador into this world that he loves. God sent his son because he loves the world and God still loves the world. So he sent you. He wants you and I to love each other and minister to each other's needs. He wants us to represent the kingdom of Christ and live like it, knowing that eternal life has been secured by Jesus. That we're not to be worried about eternity. That Jesus, if we look to Jesus, eternity is taken care of. But if we have looked to Jesus, if we are trusting in him truly, let's not take our faith in Jesus and make another bronze serpent. Let's not just sit around and worship our faith in Jesus. It's more about just having faith. Now, salvation is secured by faith through Jesus, right? Jesus has given us faith. He's given us salvation. But let's not make that the thing. What do we do because we believe that? How do we live because we believe on Jesus? So many of us say, well, I believe on Jesus, but I'm not doing anything else. If you really believe, listen to what Jesus says. Condemnation does not come because people don't have faith. (laughs) I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Jesus, listen to what he says. This is Jesus speaking. This is the condemnation, verse 19, that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Listen, we're condemned without Christ. And without Christ, 
Our deeds are evil. Everyone practicing evil hates the light. Jesus is that light. He does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Like if you really believe, it should change how you live. I'm not knocking faith. I'm not knocking grace. I believe that salvation comes through the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe that. But as James said, faith without works is dead. Just like the body without the spirit is dead. Faith without works, being alone, is dead. If you really believe, practice what is good. Listen to what he says. This is Jesus. But he who does the truth, not he who believes the truth, he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen. Look, I know that there might be some confusion. Jesus is not saying that faith is by works. He is saying that the truth is that real faith produces good works. Real faith in Jesus will cause you to want to do good to one another. John says in one of his letters to the church that he who hates his brother says he loves God is a liar. You cannot love God and hate your brother. How can you say that you love God whom you can't see but then hate your brother whom you see every day. That the two must line up. Your faith must match your life. If you really believe, practice that which is good. He who does the truth. If you believe on Jesus, let your light shine. Let your light shine before men. Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. Please pray with me. Father God, Thank you for your grace, which we find in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the healing. Thank you for the salvation. Thank you for the faith and the peace that we enjoy. I pray, Lord, for everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, that that you would make your face shine on them, that they would see your light, Lord, and that they would recognize their need for you. And Lord, we are desperate, desperate for your presence and your grace. Help us to look to you always, to look to you and find healing, to look to you, Jesus, and find strength. Let our lives be a light to those who are around us. Start in our homes, Lord. Let a revival break out right now. Just as some virus has spread across the land, God, let your salvation and let the name of Jesus become viral and spread like a wildfire throughout the land. Cause revival. Bring healing to our world in the name of Jesus. Lift up the sun that all who look upon him would be healed and live. Give us the strength to lift up Jesus. Give us the strength. I pray it in his name. Amen.